Hello everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar to the 356 people we have joining us tonight. Um, my name's Steve Trumbull and I am facilitating this panel we have for you tonight. Uh, so before we introduce you to them, let me just acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We do wish to pay our respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So as I've said, Steve Trumbull's my name. I'm a general practitioner by background uh, and head of medical education at the Melbourne Medical School where I am at the moment. Um, we, do, we did disseminate the biographies for the panel with the webinar invitation, so we won't go through those again in detail. But uh, just to introduce people very quickly, uh, the f actually, yet yeah, the first person to introduce then is Dr. Andrew Leach, who's from Western Australia. He's currently suffering some of the qualms of the NBN getting across the nullarbor, but hopefully we've got you there. Andrew, welcome. Yep. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me tonight. It's so good to hear your voice. Hopefully your image is also moving. Um, <laughs> I need to ask you, Andrew, as a fellow general practitioner, what sparked your interest in uh, working with children uh, in general practice, particularly those with mental health problems? Yeah, I think um, generally my interest in working with children has come over, developed over time. I've come to realise that children do respond well to treatment and it's, it's a really positive thing to actually see that and also making that change and giving them a bit of hope really can go a long way in the future and you can really change the trajectory of a child's life by intervening in small amounts and as a GP you seem to have a good um, role in doing that. So I think it's just built up over time, really enjoy it. Fantastic and you obviously get the sort of practice that you feel most comfortable with and have the most to offer so that's, that's great. Mm. I'll introduce our next speaker then, who's Professor David Coghill, who's a, uh, a psychiatrist just actually up the road here in Melbourne. Uh, so, David, welcome. I think we've got you labelled as guest. You're actually a, pretty much a regular on these webinars, so it's good to, good to have you again. It's great to be back, Steve. Thanks. Excellent. Dave, can you tell us about your role in the neurodevelopmental uh, disorders team at the Royal Children's Hospital? What does that team actually do? Yeah, so uh, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and I guess unusual in Australia that um, my major is in neurodevelopmental disorders um, and working at the Royal Children's Hospital when I came here just about four years ago, realised that uh, psychiatry was actually absent from the, the neurodevelopmental sphere here. So we've created a multidisciplinary team, a very small multidisciplinary team, uh, with two psychiatrists, a uh, neuropsychologist and a nurse. And we ra really manage those complex cases that the paediatricians um, in the hospital and around Melbourne are having difficulties with. Fabulous. Well, we certainly need your support. You're not Australian by birth then? Uh, not Australians, pr proudly Scottish by birth. Okay, I can pick that up. So good to have you again, Dave. And also uh, returning to the webinars is um, Dr. Georgette Fleming. Hello, Georgie, you're a psychologist in New South Wales. That's correct, Steve. Thanks for having me. Well, it's good to have you back. And uh, you did circulate a paper to us when we were preparing for the webinar, which was a review of the um, callous, uh, callous unemotional traits, which can sometimes identify in people at the more severe end of the conduct disorder spectrum. How do you differentiate between typical conduct disorder and what we would label as um, callous or unemotional traits? Yeah, it's a good question and something that I'll be talking about a little bit later on in the webinar. But essentially, it's all of the all of the criteria of conduct disorder plus an additional hit of lack of guilt and remorse, lack of empathy, unconcern about their performance and important things, and an interesting way of expressing emotions. That's quite instrumental, switching on and off. So if you get the double hit of that, it's important because you tend to have a worse prognosis and worse treatment outcomes. Okay, we'll look forward to hearing more about that because obviously there's plenty in this case that relates to, uh, to those sorts of behaviours, so uh, looking forward to it. And finally, but uh, definitely not least, to welcome um, David Hogg. Now, David, you're a mental health nurse by training, but uh, you work in a particular counselling practice. How prevalent is conduct disorder within your practice there in New South Wales? I think conduct disorder in my practice is, is a minority, but I do have a lot of uh, ADHD and ODD, severe ODD behavior with lots of violence and internet addiction. 
Uh, so that has been my client load for some 30 years. Okay, well, we'll look forward to hearing about that. I must say that massage chair behind you has attracted a lot of attention in the preparation of the webinar. I think we all want to go in that. It looks <laughs> looks fantastic. But anyway, enough about that. Um, speaking of high technology, I wanted to spend a few moments introducing you to this webinar platform for those who haven't used it before. There's plenty going on behind the scenes, and I'll give you a little bit of introduction to some of the things that make a webinar so much better than just a broadcast lecture. The opportunity is there to interact. Um, there's a chat box you can access by the purple button there on your screen and people have already been chatting there and it's a great way of communicating with others about things that are coming up in the conversation that you want to have a bit of a, a chat about in real time. If you want to ask a question of the panel, we've already received a number of questions that we'll be uh, looking at during the course of the, um, the webinar, but also if a question comes up you want to ask um, more immediately, the blue button is where you enter your question. So please click on that and enter a question. We'll try and pull them together so that uh, the most important important questions emerging during the webinar are answered. The slide, the slide set and other resources that we might make available, uh, you can download by hitting the light blue button uh, when they're all posted. And if things go wrong with the webinar, as can happen, there's a help button um, which you can use and um, that will take you through to the, uh, uh, the conference providers, Redback directly, or there's also a phone number you can call, which I think is on your screen there somewhere. So what we're going to do is obviously work our way through the case because there's plenty in there to discuss. Each of our panellists will give a short discipline specific presentation and then there'll be a period of questions and answers uh, we'll discuss between the panel members about the best way to deal with this case and other ones like them. So that's the way it all works. What I need to do now is to um, get on with taking us through the presentation. I just want to uh, look at the um, learning outcomes first of all because they're really important obviously. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is make sure, I hope we can make sure that when the webinar is complete, we hope we'll be able to describe the biological, genetic, environmental, psychological and social factors that can contribute to conduct disorders. It's not a simple matter. We'll also hope that you are able to identify the challenges, merits and opportunities in evidence-based approaches deemed the most effective in treating and supporting children and adolescents who are experiencing conduct disorder. And finally, uh, because this is all about collaboration between health professionals, we hope you'll be able to implement a referral pathway to support children and adolescents with conduct disorder, um, including, of course, the involving the school, which has been a major um, feature that's come up in the um, questions that have been posed in the, pre in the preparation so far. So they're the uh, learning objectives. Um, we'll now get ready to move on to um, the first presentation and we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Andrew Leach, our GP. Andrew, five hot minutes from you on the GP's approach. I think you might be muted. Andrew, have you got your sound up? Can you hear me now, Steve? Yeah, there's no wire to yep. your headsets as well. What's going on there? Yes, I know. Very confusing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, can you see my slides okay? Uh, yep, we've got your slides yep, up. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, look, I think it's important to start with looking at the DSM criteria for conduct disorder to actually fit, figure out if Aaron fits into this criteria and this diagnosis. And looking at those criteria, they're actually quite overwhelming. There's about 15 different criteria, um, but only need, three need to be fulfilled and one in the last six months. And certainly looking at Aaron um, and some of these subheadings you can see here, um, the, the criteria of aggression to people, animals, destruction of property, deceitfulness of set and serious violation of rules. I could pluck out a few of those and looking at threat, threatening others physical fighting at school, truancy from school and often staying out at night was just about enough to clinch that diagnosis of conduct disorder. So I'll talk a little bit more about other diagnoses that might come into play here, but I guess the initial thing is looking at how we're going to engage Aaron in um, healthcare as a whole. And GPs are a, a good first point of call for this to happen. Um, I think in general practice, um, we, we have the ability to follow up patients like this over time. And so letting Aaron know that this is a safe space to talk about how things are going, to really um, to elaborate on his story, to discuss it with us um, uh, and to really help to um, 
work out where things are going and some of the issues that are arising. I think it's important as well also to engage the family in that first few consults. So, you know, talking about, um, you know, how, how is um, the, the dynamics at home between him, his mum, which clearly have been very challenging, as well as any other care providers that might be involved. The other important aspect is obviously establishing his risk. He's indicated, I don't know, that he might use a knife um, or, or equivalent. And so establishing that he is safe and whether we need to really raise the acuity of the situation and whether he um, has access to tools such as that. Um, moving on, though, I guess the GP's role is really about collaboration and involving a team. I don't think I could deal with this on my own. I, I think I'd be quite overwhelmed. And it's, you know, it's OK to recognise that. But who are we going to involve and how are we going to involve them is a really critical step for general practitioners. So that initial contact, as I said, establishing his risk and then moving on and getting him back to follow up to work out a plan. And that plan can be incorporated into the mental health treatment plan. And he would be eligible to use this as a tool for accessing psychology. But there's probably going to be other providers that we need to use for Aaron. Um, the other benefit of the mental health treatment plan, I find, is listing goals. And I keep those goals quite direct and quite simple. So how are we going to improve his thinking, his situation, his attendance at school? What, what strategies can we really implement? And how can we improve his overall, um, his overall life, really? Equally as important is mum. And uh, clearly she's suffering and struggling and she's frustrated and she's self-treating with alcohol and she has a history of drug use as well. So we need to really improve her situation, inviting her back for her own discussions and treatment and potentially referring her on and looking at whether we can involve dad at all or, or stepdad. Um, so overall, I guess looking at that as a whole is offering support. We have that unique ability to really hold the family, get them back whilst they attend other appointments. We can get them back afterwards to see how they're going, looking at where it didn't work out in the past. Why, why did he, he engage with the psychologist previously? How can we make that easier for him? And chipping away at this, seeing him on his own, really gathering and building that rapport with Aaron. It's also important to mention uh, the role of um, the GP in looking at the diagnosis. We've already mentioned conduct disorder as a diagnosis. But there's no doubt Aaron has other diagnoses occurring here. And it, he's already been diagnosed with ADHD and ODD. ODD is a little bit different, more a defiance and, and sort of um, being, you know, um, less cooperative than being actually aggressive and causing uh, damage and danger. So uh, he probably does have crossover into all those other areas. Also, I like to do medical testing, sometimes looking at whether he's sleeping okay, does he need a sleep study, does he need any blood tests, for, or is there a nutritional underlying problem going on? So it is really multifactorial. Um, and this slide really paints a picture nicely that conduct disorder... Oh, I'll do the, just, uh, That's OK, sorry, Andrew. My slide's got a bit disjointed there. Conduct disorder... Sorry, my slides went a bit uh, haywire. Um, that conduct disorder doesn't rarely occur... rarely occurs on its own in isolation. Um, and it's often co crosses over to mixing with other conditions, as we've seen with Aaron already. Um, so I guess in summary, we, we need to take this step by step. We can't rush it. We need follow up. We need regular steps along and regular touching base with Aaron along the way and building up that picture of what's going on, looking at him, also looking at the family situation, knowing that that's really important to his well-being, that a positive home environment is going to make a big difference talking to the school. The GP does have a role in talking to the school, but it's not always easy to contact the school. So it may involve other team members as well in having that interaction in school and putting some things in place. And then also on to the management, which we're going to talk about. And that might be referring on to a paediatric psychiatrist um, or a paediatrician. So um, just bring up the summary slide here. That's OK, yeah, Andrew. We are having yep. some connection problems, so you're buffering a little bit, no but uh, we can hear you, which oh, is no the main thing. And yeah, we can yeah, see yeah, the no slides. Worries. Yeah, so that's fine. Oh, that's good. Yeah, in summary, I guess, um, speaking with each of those people in turn, Aaron at the centre of this uh, with his treatment, getting that effective communication with him, referring him to a child psychologist, maybe a paediatrician or a psychiatrist, and then involving the parents where it might be a positive parenting program that you could refer them on to, the family as a whole, and touching base with the, um, you know, something like Relationships Australia to really work on family counselling or the psychologists as well, integrating them, and then the classroom. So it's a whole system approach to Aaron, and it's not going to happen quickly, but if it does work out, it will be very rewarding. So thank you.
OK, good. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew. And certainly the GP's got a central role there in developing that trust with uh, all the important people in Aaron's life. So thanks for taking us through that. Well, now, so uh, as a GP, you've made a referral to the psychiatrist and you were lucky enough to get in to see uh, David Coghill. So, David, please take us through the psychiatrist's perspective. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Andrew. Uh, I mean, the first thing I want to say is if I had um, all of my referrals with as much consideration as you've put to them, Andrew, then uh, life would be... Be, be much easier. I think often we're strapped by um, a, a lack of information being transferred between, uh, between professionals. One of the things I would want to consider first, in fact I certainly would consider first when I'm thinking about this referral, is, is who else is already involved. And I'm not thinking just of the, the health professionals, I'll come back to them um, slightly later on in, in the story, but in particular have social work child, and child protection been involved? Uh, and are they currently involved? And if they aren't involved, why? Um, and, and my reason for doing this is that often people have um, perhaps unrealistic expectations about what health professionals can and, and ought to be doing um, in cases like Aaron's. And uh, for me, it's, again, very important to let the referrer know and let the family know when I meet them on the limits of what I can and can't do. I'm not trained in social work. I don't have a statutory child protection role, although, of course, I'll be reporting any child protection issues. And I'm not there 24-7. Um, so not always able to respond to social crises or, or domestic crises. So we need to make sure that those kind of supports are there. What I can do is I can provide a broad and comprehensive mental health and developmental assessment, and that would really be the first part of my, um, my, my intervention. Specifically, I personally would be looking for other mental health disorders. We've already heard possibility of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, sometimes even episodes of serious mental illnesses like bipolar disorder that may well be contributing. So to um, confirm or, or, or exclude them would be uh, one of my first tasks. I'd be particularly interested in the um, uh, current risks for Aaron. And again, when we get a referral of a, a child and we hear that that child has been aggressive, has been violent, has been causing difficulties, we often jump to just think about the risks for those around Aaron, and certainly there are risks for those around, around Aaron from his violence, not just his family, but has he been violent to other children, um, and, and how are we going to, to make sure those risks are managed. But also there are many risks for Aaron himself. He's putting himself at risk. He's at risk of exploitation, um, at risk of substance misuse, as we've heard, sexually transmitted diseases, and actually something we can't can't forget is suicidality. Um, children may come as a surprise to, to, to many of the um, subscribers to the, uh, the webcast, but children with ADHD have a 10 times higher risk of suicide and suicidal behaviours than those without. So I would be very interested in Aaron's ADHD. Does he still have significant symptoms and impairment? I'd also be interested in understanding whether Aaron's father and or mother have undiagnosed and untreated ADHD. One of the things we know about the relationship between ADHD and conduct disorder is that the relationship flows from ADHD to conduct disorder. And because of that, actually treating the ADHD can have a big impact on the conduct and um, aggressive behaviours it, itself. I'd also want to, to know about current home, school and work situation. And that's really because we need to understand where the current resources are, who has a connection with Aaron, who has a relationship with him, who sees him on a regular basis, because this is all going to become part of the, um, of, of the treatment plan. And also to understand from Aaron himself What's he doing with his time? What's his views about his current life? Uh, what does he enjoy? Is, is there anything that he enjoys about his current life? Part of that's about engaging, but again, looking at opportunities for where we can step in and support him and build up his strengths. 
So if ADHD is a problem, I'd be first looking to treat this for, for Aaron and getting his parents assessed and treated as required. As I said, this can actually have a big impact on the uh, conduct disorder and, and other problems he has. If we're thinking about treating the conduct disorder itself, though, a psychiatrist on his own is going to make very little difference. And I look to the team uh, that can be built around Aaron that I can work with, and we're going to hear from psychologists and, and from a family therapist in that respect. And we use a, an approach called multi-systemic therapy. It's the best evidence treatment for, for conduct disorder, and it involves a social learning model, but with interventions that are actually towards the individual, the family, the school, criminal justice system, and at a community level. Unfortunately, it's very expensive to do well. It's manualized, and we, we can, can teach how to do it, but it's not readily available in that pure form in Australia. But I think, as we'll hear from other presenters, that if we can think laterally and put a package together, as long as everyone's on board and motivated, then we can actually um, look to, to help Aaron, help his family, and improve the situation. I just very briefly mentioned something called collaborative problem solving that you might like to take a note of and go and look up. It's a, a, an alternative approach to challenging and explosive behaviors, uh, developed by a guy called Ross Green in the States, and uh, now really quite well developed um, as a, a different way of, of dealing with challenging behaviors. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Dave. And I'm going to preempt a question or a lot of questions that have been asked about the use of medication. From what you've just told us, really, the only role for medication, as I see it, is in maybe manage, uh, managing the initial ADHD. Is that really what you're saying? Uh, I, I'm very reluctant to use medications to manage conduct disorders. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of medication that is used, a lot of um, atypical antipsychotics, sometimes um, SSRI antidepressants. Really, the evidence for them being a core treatment for conduct disorder is pretty slim. They can help um, sometimes more in those with other neurodevelopmental disorders like autism in reducing aggressive behavior but they have horrendous long-term side effects. And if we are going to start medications, then the, the, the one thing that I insist on having is an exit strategy. So we need to know that this will be short-term and how we're actually going to move away from it. Okay, so this is where obviously a psychologist would be involved. Um, let's now hear from Georgie and uh, your thoughts, Georgie, on what your approach would be in assessing Aaron and his family. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So from a clinical psychology perspective, you're obviously driven by your assessment. And as mandatory reporters, as a couple of the other presenters have already mentioned, we're assessing, assessing for risk. So risk of harm to both Aaron and to Aaron's mom as well. And depending on who is your client. So if your client is Aaron, you may not be able to provide what mum needs and so it will be very important to be linking mum in with her, her own services and getting a team happening around mum. Chances are you're going to have to lodge a report with the appropriate child protection agencies and involve the necessary services to case manage um, a presentation like Aaron's. I also want to draw our attention to a couple of other things in terms of our assessment. So number one, that there's an early diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and oppositional defiant disorder, which suggests that Aaron's conduct problems have an early onset. And this is important for reasons I'll get into in a second. Also want to note that there's a family history of antisociality and substance use, which is again important from a heritability perspective and whether Aaron has a genetic predisposition towards this sort of presentation. And finally, I'm interested in the previous treatment history. So what was low adherence related to in terms of the psychostimulant use? Was it non-compliance? Was it side effects? Because working with psychiatrists, you want to know what was getting in the way of um, that being an effective intervention. And finally, what's going on with the psycho psychological intervention that he had in the past? Why was it just with him? Why not mum? What did they work on? What worked and what didn't? 
So after this, you're obviously going to move on towards your presenting problems, which as we've heard are consistent with a diagnosis of conduct disorder and probably a couple of other things in there as well. But really this is ultimately toward establishing a clinical formulation, which is really a clinical story of how this family, how this child got to be where they're at and what's keeping them stuck in this dysfunctional cycle of interaction or um, of behaviour. And really we use our clinical in, uh, formulation then to identify our points of intervention. So I want to draw our attention to a couple of things. So number one, again, the family history. Can't change that. That's a kind of a developmental um, kind of factor in the formulation. But what we might be able to change are some other things. So in particular, significant strain in the mother-child relationship. There's a lot of parental harshness happening from mum, as well as a lack of parental warmth, which may be important, as well as a lack of or inconsistent use of consequences. In terms of what Aaron's bringing to the table, because this is always bi-directional, I'm noticing some impulsivity, which may be an import, playing an important part of the story, as well as a possible punishment insensitivity. Does discipline work with him and why not if it doesn't? As well as difficulty with responsibility taking and expressing or experiencing remorse or guilt for his behaviour. Finally, there are a couple of environmental things as well. There's a lot of modelling going on, so he's witnessing violence and substance use, he's probably hanging out with some deviant peers, and there's a low socioeconomic status um, probably operating here as well. What I want to move into talking about why the formulation is important is a couple of other diagnostic considerations before we get into treatment planning. So number one, as we've already mentioned, we're assessing for mood and substance use, particularly around um, suicidality, uh, anxiety and depression. But I also want to go into the other diagnostic specifiers for conduct disorder, which number one is determining the age of onset. So did Aaron's conduct problems first onset before the age of 10? And if they did, can we give him the specifier of childhood onset? And this is important because we know that these are the kids who have a different prognosis, who are more likely to stay on this antisocial trajectory as they move forward. But most importantly, as I was talking about at the start of the webinar, is there evidence for limited pro-social emotions? And this is known in research, in the research world and in some clinical circles as well as callous unemotional traits. Now, in terms of kind of a practical take-home thing, you can screen for callous unemotional traits using a freely available measure called the inventory of callous unemotional traits. And there's a parent version, a teacher version, and a self-report version as well. So what are callous unemotional traits and how does a child obtain a diagnosis of one? So in order to obtain a diagnosis of this specifier of with limited pro-social emotions, currently a kid has to meet diagnostic criteria for conduct disorder and then demonstrate two or more of the following criteria over a period persistently of 12 months in more than one across multiple settings and relationships. So it has to be persistent and it has to be pervasive. And these symptoms are a lack of remorse or guilt, a unconcern about the effect of behaviour on others, a lack of empathy, so a callousness, a lack of concern about other people's feelings, particularly their distress, an unconcern about their performance in important activities. So this might be at school or in a part-time job or in extracurricular activities. They just don't really care about how well they do. And then this shallow or deficient affect, which is this interesting emotional uh, responding style where you see a lot of an instrumental use of emotions or switching of emotions on and off in order to obtain some sort of goal or reward. And the reason why I'm choosing to focus on this subgroup of kids is because these are the kids among all of those who have conduct disorder who tend to have the worst prognosis. They have more stable problems, more severe problems, more aggressive problems, highest risk of delinquency and crime later on. We also know that they have different risk and maintaining factors. So the clinical story, that formulation is different for these kids. It's much more heritable, more highly genetic, uh, less environmental factors playing in here. And for this reason, our traditional treatments don't tend to work as well for these kids because we're kind of targeting the wrong things. So in terms of the treatment planning, 
for specifically this group of children with conduct disorder and callous unemotional traits, we want to get a multi-component component treatment happening. So this is what Dave was talking about before, but specifically in your practice with this type of kid, thinking about less of a focus on adjusting mum's parenting uh, coerciveness or her inconsistency because the research suggests that's less important but what's more important is the relationship between parent and child. We want to up mum's warmth and affection to really strengthen their bond because we know this is an incredibly protective factor. I want to de-emphasize punishment, both in the context of your sessions, but also what mum's doing at home and then what teachers are doing at school. What we know about these kids is that they have a fearless temperament style, which is associated with punishment insensitivity. These kids don't learn as well from punishment. They're less affected by it. But on the flip side, they're highly driven by rewards. So I'm going to use that to my advantage in order to increase the behaviours I want to see more of and reduce those I want to see less of. Use rewards. And finally, I'm going to spend a lot of time working one-on-one -on -one with Aaron to improve his emotional skills. So in particular, I'm going to use CBT style approaches to increase his emotional literacy, so micro-expression training, particularly around other people's distress cues. We know these kids are less good at recognizing and responding to sadness in others fear in others in particular. I'm going to teach him how to do perspective taking to facilitate empathy and finally we're going to work with him on social problem solving, more appropriate ways of responding to other people in particular situations. And like we've mentioned before, my take home message is that this is going to be a multidisciplinary intervention. Thanks very much. Great, wonderful. Thanks very much indeed, Georgie. And it's interesting that um, a couple of interesting questions have come up that I don't know if you want to address now, particularly uh, people saying that the police can often get involved in these sorts of cases and that it looks like different states have different approaches to dealing in the justice system with uh, children in particular uh, with conduct disorder. Do you have any thoughts on that before we go to David? Not so much. I think it's, it's hard because it's going to be state by state. So you want to make sure that, um, that the appropriate people are involved. And if the criminal justice system has been involved, and we know that these kids often present in juvenile justice um, or juvenile correction facilities, that the people who are working with them in that context are also aware of the most evidence-based approaches for intervening with these kids if they are criminal justice system involved. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks very much indeed. Again, now we'll go to David, your family therapist and mental health nurse. Can you tell us what your approach would be to working with somebody in Aaron's situation? Well, one of the most important thing is that I will come from a very systemic perspective to appreciate conduct disorder in the home environment, the school environment, in the community. And there's a study by uh, Langa, which is on your slide here, the study on family factors associated with ADHD and emotional disorder, high stress, lack of support, low parental quality of life, family functioning difficulties, low parenting satisfaction, and parental psychological health problems may all predispose biologically vulnerable youngsters to develop worse psychological problems that they might otherwise have. Clearly, this particular study has reflected very much on error. If you think about it, he doesn't really stand much of a chance if you look at what's happened to Aaron, he is progressively deteriorating, leading to severe conduct problems. And then when you look at the next slide, which is more ADHD in the family system, this particular book called I by Everett and Everett identify ADHD in the family context. Uh, what are the common themes that emerge in families with, with an ADHD child? We talk about vertical loyalties and dependency. And what that really meant is that a lot of adult ADHD or young adolescents have really not separated or individuated from a family system. And part of that is that you can just appreciate adolescents going through adolescenthood. Uh, the process of autonomy and separation is a key, key, uh, key point of development. It's not uncommon that they're developmentally arrested. So it's also not uncommon they're treated more like 10 or 12 years old when they're 16. So this sense of overprotectiveness can cause a lot of frustration with young people, partly because they are more likely to do wrong things with their impulsive behavior. So parents are more likely to keep them at home, for example. 
Then when you look at vertical loyalties, if you look at a lot of adults with ADHD, they're more loyal to their parents and to their spouse. And that can contribute to a lot of uh, a horizontal conflict between the spouse relationship. Also not uncommon, you, as you can appreciate, even with Aaron's story, there's a lot of conflict around marital relationship, poor parental control and interaction. Uh, partly, like, like Georgia has touched on, harsh parenting, abusive parents, uh, dysfunctional family conflict patterns. And I'm very interested to look at the, the dynamic that contribute to the interaction of patterns around a problem, particularly, particularly when you have authoritarian parenting style and are more likely to be quite harsh. How often, though, when we look at Aaron's story, we can say, how much is Aaron scapegoated in his own family system? And because it's not uncommon as well, scapegoating gets transmitted across generations. How often, too, normal siblings miss out because of Aaron's difficulties? Bearing in mind, in family system therapy, you want to know that the normal child don't get missed out because they're more likely to become very resentful and reject of Aaron. The part that really strikes me the most when I work with ADHD for some 30 years now is a sense of poor self-worth. How often though, and it's such a pervasive problem across academic, social, and occupation, and how often these young people have become so sophisticated at avoiding learning. You know, it's become like, like they prefer, in their construct, in their head, is that they prefer to do bad things and naughty things and perhaps to think that they're, perhaps they're stupid. But in fact, they're not stupid. They just have learning difficulties undiagnosed and untreated. So I particularly want to uh, make it overt or make it explicit, the construct in their head. Because once you make it explicit, then the likelihood is that you can play with it. The framework that I tend to work with ADHD and family system is very much from a multi-generational uh, family narrative. Uh, and Dolphy, as you can see on this multi-generational side, said, being born is like being thrown a book already people by characters and stories. It is to be exposed to a reality whose rules are already written. Or persons who alter the thread of this narrative, which is a positive thing because history doesn't have to be our future perhaps even the ending, but we will never be able to separate ourselves from the pages that precede our entrance, and those pages will inevitably influence us because we are their children. So in this particular site, I'll be very curious about the family of origin experiences of Aaron's parents. Bearing in mind there's a strong genetic uh, loading on ADHD, we're talking about 75% or more. Uh, ADHD with a kid with ADHD are more likely to also have ODD. We're talking about 50 to 80% of kids with ADHD will have ODD behavior. And a further 40% will have some form of learning difficulties. So if this is, so you're dealing with a trifecta. So all my cases are trifecta. And then you also want to learn how much is the social learning theory around violence and anger. Did they learn how to be violent because they see and witness violence? But more importantly for me, I want to go beyond the violence. I want to understand what's the meaning of this behavior. Particularly, I'll be curious, what is missing in Aaron's life? The construct of fantasies around, perhaps to some extent, the missing father, the absent father, the peripheral father, and how often these days with, um, with blended family arrangement and high divorce rate and domestic violence, the role of man has been further eroded. The man of fathers, the role of fathers has been further eroded. So how much is though the construct in his head around his father? What does he think about that? The idea of, is my father all bad? Or is there something good about him? I would want to know that. I want to make it explicit so that you can again play with it. How much is the shame, the embarrassment to know that your father is in and out of jail? But particularly, I'm also very curious about two particular areas. I'm curious about from the attachment lens. It's not uncommon. A lot of conduct disorder comes from very disorganized attachment or the trauma lens and also the family development. Particularly when we talk about family development, I'm very curious about the significant events in the family history. So particularly, what are the experiences 
of Aaron's parents from their own parenting experience from their own parents. You know, it's so often that, as you can appreciate if you apply Bowen's theory, uh, anxiety can be transmitted across generations. And then when you come to talk about treatment, uh, David Koch, he will have identified multisystemic therapy as evidence-based. I'm not sure about Melbourne. Here in Sydney, uh, there are pockets of multisystemic therapy available. However, they are only referred by child protection or family and community services. They are highly labor-intensive. They are very uh, structured. They are, uh, they, are, they are on call, close to on call 24-7. They don't finish work until uh, 10 or 11 o'clock. <clears throat> they can attend to a lot of crises, which is very important. Uh, I'm, I am involved in a modified form of uh, multisystemic therapy. Uh, when I make a commitment to a child with conduct disorder, I will involve the youth police liaison officer. I'm not sure about other states, but here in Sydney, I have a youth police liaison officer in Castle Hill. I will invite him to join therapy, join me for therapy, and he's, uh, he has been very helpful and he come and join me for therapy. And the youth police liaison office is a kind of different kind of a breed of police. They provide a much more psycho-education approach to some of these conduct disorder kids. They come here, they kind of not harsh on them. They kind of both psycho-educational uh, involved. In the past, I've been involved in uh, community conferencing, which is an exceptionally powerful way of, of dealing with some of these delinquent kids or who are heading towards JJ services. Uh, at the same time, too, I've been working with school system now for some 30 years. I particularly take on a very collaborative approach about how to work with school systems because I want to identify uh, resources and, uh, and, and mobilize resources. So, for example, I would like to mobilize resources from the church, from the youth group, particularly uh, from PCYC who uh, have boxing uh, uh, days for young people. So I'm very keen on, on all those areas. Of, of cooperation. I work very closely with a lot of uh, psychiatrists. I, I can appreciate Dr. Uh, Koch, you mentioned about the use of anti atypical antipsychotic is uh, minimal. However, used in the context of consistent therapy with health professionals, it, ha it can have its a small place because a lot of these kids are very, can be quite dangerous and in fact, very, very uh, violent. As you can appreciate, uh, Aaron has reached a point where he's holding a knife to the mother. So you cannot be not too unpredictable, but at the same time, having to appreciate the context of uh, severe uh, side effects from weight, weight gain is a big problem. Uh, so I would think about that. So when you look at multi-systemic therapy, uh, you will identify what are the benefits. First of all, it's a home-based service. The clients don't have to come to you. You actually go to the client. So that actually provides the opportunity to facilitate and enhance your therapeutic arrangement. Uh, secondly, it's very, ecologically, it's very ecologically based. You get to see the home environment, you get to see how they live, and that, and that will help you to design your intervention much more appropriately to what you can see that is real. For in some respect, it's very structural. You can see a reenactment happening in front of you. And the way multi-systemic therapy works is that because of the, of the intensity of the program, and it's about three to six months duration, uh, it is very, you can have a very timely fashion to respond to crisis. Close to, their, like I said before, on call 24-7, they're very intensive. And because you're conducting therapy in the client's home, you can generalize the changes much more easier. But other things that I would work is that I will work with subsystems. I will work with Aaron himself, I will work with the with a, co a parent for co-parenting strategies and ideas. I will look at the family therapy as a, as a, as a treatment modality. More importantly, I will look at reparative uh, practice. How can I help Aaron to own up to his mistakes? And how would I help Aaron to, to I said, begin to recognize that what he has done wrong? Particularly uh, when I get involved with school system, and they're suspended, they're aggressive, and they hurt somebody, I will be doing a lot of this work with Aaron about how he can make up what he's, what has, what he's done. So all in all, I think uh, that will be my part of the contribution. I will welcome any questions. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, David. And we'll move on now to the conversation, the discussion between the panel. Um, the violence in this case is just um, so apparent as you read the case study that's occurring in the home. We touched very briefly on uh, the involvement of the police in such a situation when people are holding knives to other people's throats. It's pretty uh, inevitable that the police will be involved. David Hong mentioned it. I unfairly asked Georgie for input on police involvement, and she really worked with preschoolers, but do any of our panel have further thoughts about appropriate engagement with uh, the police and judicial system um, with uh, people like Aaron and, and his family? Yeah, I, th I think I would want to comment on that, Steve. Dave Cockhill here. Um, I mean, obviously, safety first, and actually, that's something that's really, really important for us. There's a lot of violence. There's violence between multiple um, of, of the um, contributors to this to this story, and we need first, before anything else, to actually make people safe and make sure people safe. The police getting involved can be really controversial. Um, is it good? Is it bad? Actually, it can, can be both, and it really depends on the style of policing. I was really impressed to hear David Hong um, say about having a community policeman, a uh, youth policeman, that he could actually call on to be part of the treatment team. And really, that's what we would all like. We would like these systems to come together, whether it's the justice system, the welfare system, the health system, the education system, to be working together. I think that there are lots of difficulties for police because they have multiple, uh, multiple roles and, and multiple stresses, and they often work under suboptimal conditions. But very much getting them involved as part of the community and as part of the community of practice, the health community, um, both in keeping people safe, but also then looking at the ways that they can actually step in to provide some of the positive support that Georgie's uh, George is talking about. Okay, great. Thanks very much indeed. Anything further from any other panelists uh, about yeah. that? Yeah, Andrew. Can I say something, Steve? Yeah, I, I think, um, like the other speakers, I'm really big on trying to de-escalate these situations, and it's already at a you know, heightened emotions with everybody involved, and involving the police where it's appropriate is a good thing for you know a GP needs to to, to do that if they think it's appropriate, but working really hard to try and help to um, de-escalate any of that um, risk that is emerging and um, trying to create a more positive flow of events, I guess, instead of um, heading towards something that could end up being quite negative in the treatment. Um, I often also leave, you know, parents with, you know, a safety check. You know, if, if this does get to this point, these are the contact numbers you will need and to have them handy and don't be afraid to use those. But I think that, that's very similar to what the other speakers have said, you know, involving them in a positive way if possible and using them where appropriate, um, but really trying hard to, to keep this, um, the treatment flowing and hopefully not stepping back into, you know, charges and things like that for Aaron, which he probably doesn't need at the moment when he's trying to get better. Absolutely. So, Andrew, also, while I've got you, what about involving other organisations like Headspace? Have you had much involvement with um, Headspace in managing children like um, Aaron? Yeah, I think Headspace would be a really appropriate referral for a GP. Um, they they work closely in this space. Um, the problem in some states, including where I am in Western Australia, there is quite a long wait time to get into Headspace, anywhere from sort of six to eight to ten weeks. Um, and so that delay means that we're going to have to do something in between while we're waiting to try and engage Aaron and keep him keep him active in the health system. Um, I also use child and, child and adolescent mental health service CAMS, which um, can also be a good step to get advice when you're not sure what to do. Um, and I think there was also a question around some of the other supports that you could involve that are free and easy to access. The parenting program Triple P is really good, um, evidence-based, positive parenting support for mum and also the circle of security. So I use both of those or refer to both of those. They are online and they have webinars as well. So I find them really useful in this sort of um, situation. 
OK, great. Thanks for that. It's interesting watching the chat room that uh, people are commenting on the different involvement of organisations such as Headspace, but also the police in the area picking up on uh, Sarah Wells there saying, we're lucky enough to have an early intervention police team that coordinates well with schools, families and the health system here in Hobart for these young people at risk. So what about schools? Does anybody have any thoughts about what sort of advice or support or involvement uh, there can be for school teachers who are uh, trying to support our Aaron. One of the things I do a lot when I go to schools is that I want to go there and I take on a much more coordinating role. I ask for a meeting generally because the, I've been seeing the child and I will say something to the, to the principal, the deputy principal, uh, we have a common client here, uh, can we have a case conference? So, and I, how can I be helpful? I think I think a one-down position when I go to the school. Partly I want to earn some brownie points from them that, that I'm there to support the teachers. Uncommon, uh, before I go, I will survey all the teachers. I ask for a round-robin survey. Particularly, I'm interested in the behaviours. So I ask them to be very objective in describing the behaviours of the young people. How much of the behaviours I would want to know is how much of the behaviours are more ADHD behaviours, how much of the behaviours are more ODD behaviours, and how much of the behaviours potentially might be learning difficulties? Because every one of them requires a different management plan. It's also not uncommon that I might organise a meeting at lunchtime with all the teachers after I have that kind of uh, uh, information. And I want to hear from them. I want to draw them together so that they can support each other about the plans that they have worked. Because I would by then have put together a summary of all the observations that they have put together for me and how much is the ADHD behaviours. And then I was <clears> also <throat> talking to the pediatrician about how much maybe the child is at not at optimal level of management when you talk about stimulant medication. Because one of the, one of the, one of the research on, uh, on ADHD was the, what are the competency standards required to work with ADHD. And they've identified five areas. And those competency standards of the, having to appreciate the neurobiological perspective of ADHD to appreciate the medication and education aspects of ADHD, to appreciate the parenting, uh, the, the, the experiences of, uh, of other diagnoses, the comorbidity. Uh, so it's very important then as a clinician that when you're working with this particular very challenging, very complex client load, you have to work out, do you treat the ADHD first or you treat anxiety? Because anxiety can mask ADHD symptoms. The same as depression can mask ADHD symptoms. I'm very curious about where you are. That's why I work very closely with the child psychiatrist, because we work off each other and we provide much more comprehensive care, you know? Mm -hmm. So in terms of school system, lastly, I want to identify the resources in the school. Particularly, I want to interview the child and, and ask him, tell me all about your teachers. Tell me all about what subject you like, what subject you don't like, what subject you hate, because that gives me some valid information that we might be on the track, on the right track to identify learning difficulties, for example. So I like to do that. So just before um, Dave Cockhill pitches in, um, we're, we're really interested in these school meetings, David. Who would be the essential members of that meeting? Who would have to be in the room for it to be a success in general terms? Every, every school is different. Uh, if I want authority, if I want to go in with some authority, I would ask for a deputy principal to be present for very obvious reason. I want authority. I want, and then I go in, I want to advocate for the child. So the most common people that go with the year coordinator, generally the school counsellor and the, and the deputy principal, if I ask for them. Otherwise, if I don't want to pull in the, the heavy duty people, I don't need the authority, then I will just have to get in the school counsellor and the year advisor. Not uncommon. A lot of the times, by the time the, the young people come to me, things is very difficult between home and school. The school blame the parents, the parents bring the school. And because I have uh, mediation training, I'm a trained mediator, I can use my mediation skill in a good way. For example, I will focus on the needs of the child rather than the two parties are disputing. I think on a very kind of like gray area. Half the time when I go to school, I try to find line between advocating for the student and the parents and advocating for the teachers in the school. So we are trying to find line. But I find that in 30 years of working in schools, and I do a lot of training on <clears throat> systems and ADHD, so, so it's been, uh, been a pleasure, really. And I have not found too many schools that will not, in, will, not in, will not allow me to go there. A very small percentage will not be party to this. 
OK, thanks for that. We might actually hear from um, Georgie first of all, and I'm not sure whether, Dave, you had something to add as well, but Georgie yeah. Fleming on involving the schools. Yeah, I was uh, thinking of two things in the context of involving schools. Number one being the importance of providing teachers with psychoeducation. What we know from the literature and from clinical practice is that teachers, although they're often the first to identify that these sorts of problems are a problem, um, they don't feel adequately trained to manage them in the classroom or really even understand how they develop or how they're maintained. So I think from a clinical psychologist's perspective, doing a lot of psychoeducation provision in order to up skill teachers in understanding the various types of presentations of conduct disorders as well as how best to manage those presentations specifically in a tailored way in the classroom environment. And the second thing I wanted to talk about as well was the importance of a sense of school bondedness that a family has with their child's school. And I'm thinking in particular around the parent-teacher relationship and how important it is as a, a team member in a case like Aaron's to facilitate this relationship and allow Aaron's mum to feel linked in with the school and feel supported by the school because I think that's a huge barrier to um, kind of coordinating the multidisciplinary team is if the parent in particular feels as if they're being made a pariah by the school staff, which can often happen when we have this type of presentation of child. So that would be my two points to add around school involvement. Uh, and, and I was... Um, I, I had loads of things to say, but David and Georgie said most of them. And I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy about being on these webinars, that we, we get so much good collaborative work. One of the problems we have is it doesn't always work that way in, um, in, in, in reality, and it is something that we've really got to work at. Um, particularly, I think, in Australia, when one's working in a private practice, maybe working on your own, without colleagues around you, without a multidisciplinary team around you uh, the whole day, then you really have to work hard to make sure that you do that joined up thinking. Um, it's interesting, David, uh, family therapist now, but trained as a mental health nurse. And from my clinic in Scotland, where I was until I came here four years ago, um, our clinic was, was, if not run by nurses, a lot of the forward front-facing work was done. And most of that mediation work between schools and families was a partnership um, with our, our mental health nurses. And I think that is something that you really come up against often in the clinic, is that the family will be angry with the school, the school will be angry with the, with the family. It's tempting at times to take sides, but if you take sides, no one's ever going to win. And I think, David, your um, discussion about mediation and being able to broker that relationship, uh, and, and the same that Georgie said, is just such a huge thing, not just between families and schools, but between families and all the other agencies, individuals within those families, and all the other agencies that need to be involved. Thanks, Dave. And a number of presenters did talk about um, the uh, genetic links with this particular disorder. We've also been considering, though, in the case, the fact that uh, Aaron's mother was known to be uh, abusing alcohol during the pregnancy and other drugs, uh, as well as her father um, uh, and stepfather. What about the maternal ingestion of alcohol during pregnancy? Do we think there could be some significant um, uh, physical cause here? Well, it's an important question, although one that the answer won't change our treatment. Um, so it, it is important in understanding what might have caused some of the difficulties, and certainly those with FASD are at higher risk, not just of ADHD, not just of other neurodevelopmental disorders, but also of oppositional disorder and, and conduct disorder later on. But the other part of the story is that interaction between genetics and, and um, the environment. So, of course, those with a condition like ADHD, uh, women with, with ADHD are more likely to misuse substances, including alcohol, including um, smoking. 
and also find it harder to quit. So there's a circular relationship often between the biological and the environmental factors. And it's unfortunate because we can't turn back the clock to um, uh, have, have addressed mum's alcohol use during pregnancy. But as I say, the important thing is that it may be important for us to do more assessments to fully understand the complexity of Aaron's issues, Aaron's difficulties, the other types of learning um, and intellectual difficulties and cognitive difficulties that may be there. But in the end, it's not going to change the treatment other than us to take into account those cognitive difficulties when working with him. Thanks, Dave. So certainly interpreting those behaviours, and I'm very mindful of the other David's comment about interpreting Aaron's violence as being a form of communication of his um, uh, underlying stresses and traumas. Um, does anybody else have anything to mention at this stage? Maybe, uh, I think, Andrew, you wanted to tell us something about um, the prevalence of um, conduct disorder. Yeah, there was a, a couple of questions about how prevalent it actually is, and I was looking at some recent studies it, it, it's sitting at around 2% of children, 4 to 17-year-olds, um, and more prevalent in males. So 2.5% 2 2 um, were male and 1.6% female. So it's not the most common mental disorder in children. ADHD, anxiety disorders tend to take that. Um, but it is, you know, it is prevalent enough to be thinking about. And as I said in my slides, that it often crosses over with other disorders as well. So to be considered in that, um, in that diagnostic workup um, as we look at a child. Um, and I, I think um, we we're talking a bit about ages as well, what age is most common. And, and Aaron sort of fits that bill. You know, the, the mid to late teenage years is when it really starts to present itself. Um, uh, and the, the symptoms uh, of, from looking at the DSM symptoms can develop from you know 13 or even less. Um, so it's it's uh, that's probably um, the main sort of findings I found from looking at the research. Thanks, mm -hmm. Andrew. There certainly were a lot of questions mm -hmm. on that. Does anybody uh, just, have any just, thoughts? Yes, yeah, just, just to come in, Steve, on on that. Uh, I mean, as Georgie said, those with early onset conduct disorder, and as Andrew said in his very first slide. Conduct disorder is a serious diagnosis. You really have to transgress the rules to meet the criteria for conduct disorder. It's a word that's often thrown around um, quite glibly, but actually to, to meet the criteria for conduct disorder, you've got to be pretty serious. And those who meet it early on in life, pre teenage during primary school years certainly um, have a much higher risk of continuing problems into adult life. The, the one qualifier I would put on that is that there's some research um, come out over the last four or five years that's looked at adolescent onset conduct disorder, which we thought was um, much less likely to, to continue, much more likely to remit, but actually demonstrating that quite a significant portion of those who have an adolescent onset of conduct disorder don't remit and do continue to have problems. So whilst it's certainly true that the earlier the onset, the more likely it is to persist and the more serious it's likely to be, not all of those who develop conduct disorder in adolescence who didn't have it in childhood actually grow out of it as we, as we thought they did. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, David Hong, you've created some ripples with your mention of internet addiction. What more can you tell us about that and its connection to conduct disorder? One of the complicating uh, factor of complexity of clinical presentation these days is that is how much is uh, ADHD and internet addiction is a subset uh, problem. And so, uh, as you can appreciate with internet addiction, or what you call uh, internet misuse rather than internet addiction, is more commonly known, is that the, the, the kid, first of all, they don't go to school, they punish their parents, especially if they're of Asian heritage, it's a very powerful way of punishing parents by not going to school. Because I work with a number of uh, selective schools here in Sydney, where young adolescents, with also with comorbidity to ASD, uh, actually uh, refuse to go to school because it's such a powerful weapon. And, and if they get to get interfere, then they get extremely aggressive. I do a lot of house visits 
uh, in Sydney. Uh, as part of my role, I, I like to uh, I like to offer a service where I go to the home, and because parents have no power to bring the kid to therapy, especially with those extreme ones that lock themselves up and they end up with property damage and things like that. The other, the other part about internet addiction that complicates clinical presentation is the school refusal. The school refusal. So how often then uh, there's severe anxiety and how, how, how they actually, uh, internet was a way of coping initially, end up becoming a huge problem. In the Asia-Pacific market, we're talking about Korea, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, we're talking about 15% and maybe up to 20% of young people are addicted to internet. I think less, less so in the Western country. So it's actually an emerging big problem. And yet, at the moment, really, we're not sure how to treat it properly. Number one, they can't get them to therapy. <laughs> number two, they get violent. And number three, they're not motivated. The parents are your customer. So, uh, so I've done a lot of house visit with some of these challenges, and I'm still baffled to what is the best approach at this point. Uh, Does do sound like a to... great topic for another webinar, Dave. <laughs> We're going to get plenty on that one, I'm sure. Mm. But thank you all. Thank you very much for that. It's now time for us to move to the summing up, and we'll go around the panel one by one. So, Andrew, us GPs are known overseas as family physicians. Let's hear about your thoughts now on where you stand as a family physician for this. Uh, this family and its problems. Yeah, I certainly didn't think I'd be seeing children with conduct disorder when I went through GP training, and it's um, a more complex area than I imagined um, I'd be having to deal with. So I guess understanding that um, it, you know it, um, it is a, it is can be very hard and can be very challenging, and to accept that and that you know it's not we might not get it right the first time, but really helping to build up that team for Aaron so that. You can all work together on this problem and also developing that therapeutic alliance with Aaron, letting him know that you're worth, you're with him, you're on his side and you're trying to um, do what you can to help him and that, you know, in a non, as least judgmental manner as you can, respecting him as well. Um, I think that's what I was trying to get across is that, um, that creating that, um, that real nurturing environment for Aaron so that, you know, you can work together at tackling this Okay. Well, thank you for that. That uh, it's 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 certainly a challenge, and I don't think we did prepare you for it in GP training. You're you're quite right. So um, let's now hear uh, Dave uh, your thoughts in summing up. I think the first thing that comes to mind is safety. I've said it a few times, but making sure that everyone's safety is uh, ensured the best we can. Working in these kind of situations with these kind of cases has to be done as part of a team. Whether it's a formal team, a multidisciplinary team, for example, with a CAM set, within a CAM setting, or an informal team of professionals that make sure that they stay in touch, make sure that they collaborate, make sure that they're working together and not against each other, um, for me is the, the, the key to, 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 to moving forward. Great, thanks for that. And Georgie, your your sum up. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I think my biggest take home message is the importance of tailoring our treatment approach. From a clinic site's perspective, your intervention is the key and it must be individualized to the unique needs of each child of each family. In a case like Aaron's where we have this kind of intergenerational history, potentially of trauma, there's been domestic violence, there's been interpartner violence, and that's likely to have played a really important part in the clinical story. And that's probably something your treatment is going to need to address in the context of your standard kind of behaviour management approaches. So it's taking into account the story in order to develop a treatment plan and intervene in a way that specifically addresses what's maintaining this presentation for this child and in the broader context for this family. So helping mum recognise her part to play and her family of origin stuff by linking her in with the appropriate services that she needs as well. Thanks, Georgie. So clearly uh, this is going on for a long time and Aaron's in his teens now, but even as, a, as an infant, as a, as a child, the trauma and attachment issues going on then, um, it must be difficult to address those this far down the track. 
Definitely. Although what we're seeing from the literature around attachment is that it's been seen as this really unchangeable thing, but we're chipping away at potentially being able to shift patterns of attachment. In a 15-year-old, I think the jury's still out on whether we can do that, which my other take-home message being we need to get in early with this sort of child. Like we've mentioned before, early onset kind of promises a worse prognosis in a lot of cases. And if we can intervene when this child is five, younger, four or three, we're going to have a lot more traction to avoid these really entrenched, very serious trajectory of conduct problems when he's, you know, at the age where he is. Okay. And can you teach Aaron at this stage to recognise fear and discomfort in others and sadness? Yeah, the, the literature would suggest you can. It's um, whether or not we're actually... Um, inducing empathy in uh, in this population. I think, again, the research jury is still out, but I think definitely chipping away at what we know are important risk factors, so this lack of emotional literacy, if we can remediate that and we can use something like a reward dominance approach where we reward better recognition, where we reward kind of pro-sociality, then I think at least we can get him maybe into the uh, normal range of functioning, even if we're not remediating all of the more kind of biologically based or temperament based uh, deficits. Okay, but you can at least uh, give him some control over them, which would be a wonderful outcome. Thanks for that. Now, what about you, David Hong? What are your final thoughts on Aaron in his case? Uh, well, I think early intervention is really critical, really, at the end of the day. But at the same time, this kind of work with Aaron are extremely labor-intensive. I think the self-care of the therapist is an important consideration. As you can appreciate, you know, if you take on a case like that, you could be getting quite regular phone calls. And even though I'm in private practice, I make it a point uh, when I take on the case, I make a commitment to the family that I could, I could attend to that kind of requirements. But I certainly would have to turn off the phone by 10 o'clock. Uh, so the clients know that. And I have mobilized external services. So you, the other thing to recognize is that you can't do it by yourself. You require a team effort. And you need to communicate it with the team. So I think on a very kind of coordinated case management role as well in, in the world. So I don't take on too many of these cases. I will, if I do take one, I make a commitment. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you all, all our speakers for providing such a lot of information this evening. Uh, it's a very complex case, obviously, with no easy answers, but I think you've uh, covered the ground uh, with a great aplomb uh, and given us a lot more to think about. There's a few things that uh, I want to just cover off on before we close up. Uh, the first is to ask you to please complete the exit survey. You can see the yellow icon there on your screens. So if you could click on that and uh, give us the feedback we need in order to continue to improve these webinars. So please do. This is actually the last webinar from um, MHPN for the year. Christmas is coming, the end of the year. Um, the next one will be held in 2020. Um, some really important topics there, working to support the mental health of children who with, a, with an intellectual disability, really important topic on the uh, 13th of February. Heading into March then, there's one from the DVA, supporting the families of veterans, understanding the impact of veterans' mental health on their families, partners and children. So that's the second part webinar there. And finally, the 23rd of March, the ones we're talking about now, really important topic, responding to the needs of a person who presents with suicidality and of course that can be a feature in the condition we've been discussing tonight. So jump on the website there and get your registrations in soon so you'll be reminded in the new year when those webinars are coming around. A few things just to say before we close to, um, to remind you that MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with each other, uh, other mental health practitioners to share tips and resources as you've been doing tonight in the chat room, um, to, to build local referral pathways as well and to engage in CPD activities such as this. To learn more about joining your local network, um, contact MHPN or find out in the news section of their website site. Uh, and also, if you want to put a mention in your exit survey, uh, MHPN will get back in touch with you about where to find local supports. 
Um, but before I close, I would very much like to acknowledge the lived experience of uh, people and carers uh, who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you everyone for your participation this evening and I wish you all a very enjoyable festive break and see you in the new year on the next MHPN webinar. So thank you and good evening.